Hello everyone, my name is Michael, and we're going to take a look at some ransomware. Now today's sample is a uh, ransomware that goes by the name Floterra, and it's actually a variant of Vortex, which was a ransomware that um, I believe primarily targeted Polish victims uh, for whatever reason. Um, but let's just take a look at Detected Easy, kind of see it's uh, .NET, we're not seeing any obfuscation detected um, a lot of variants a lot of samples of this ransomware were heavily obfuscated in the past um, I think this was probably like an early sample that I grabbed um, so we can just go ahead and decompile it in dot net uh, DN spy so uh, one quick note before we get too far um, you will need a newer version of DN spy um, if you have like an older version like 2.0 or something it'll have trouble decompiling some of the asynchronous calls in here um, I learned that the hard way. So let's go ahead and uh, let's just take a quick look at the class names. So we have AESXWIN, seems to be the project name, likely. And then a sharp AES crypt. If we kind of just drill into here, we can see kind of just some names that might be interesting later on. That might be the main program. We have a helper's namespace that has uh, some APIs or just like wrappers for some... Uh, functions possibly. So let's go ahead and go to the entry point and let's see what happens when you run it. So it looks like we're checking for a slash reg. If you run it with a register command, it looks like it's going to add some uh, registry keys to associate itself with the right click menu. That likely that's interesting. Or you can unregister it. Now it looks like our main class is going to be this AEXX win auto. So, first off, we have a log path. That might be interesting to t watch out for. So it's at program data slash keyboard, um, which is a, that's a hidden folder. Um, and then we actually have, it uh, looks like we write, we do have a log file we're going to set up and an error log file. So they're pretty good about uh, debugging info here. We'll see it's going to have the current date and time. Uh, start program which I'm guessing is Polish for start program um, looks like they have a function for get the IP it logs that to the log or if it failed to get an IP I'm guessing that's what that says and then we have a get password function We'll see it calls another namespace of uh, eight of an API to get a password. We'll take a look at that later. Um, so then if we get a password, if it's not null, then it looks like what we actually do with it first off is we do log part of the password. So if the length is more than three, we grab zero through four, the first four characters of the password, and put it into our log. So that might be helpful later if we find like an exploit or something. Um, so let's see. Then they, oddly enough, they use a click handler to continue. And it looks like they check if there's a flag to see if it's started. If not, go ahead and start. So just from the variable names, they're actually pretty explicit here. We can see there's a queue for paths. And then um, in .NET, you use background workers. Um, it's, it's how you make a thread for offloading tasks from the UI thread. And we'll see, just from the names, I would assume we have a pathfinder that's going to find and fill in a queue, likely. Uh, that's the code for when it's done. It looks like it logs that it completed. Do work is going to be the actual working function. And we'll see... Uh, yep, it looks for the ignored paths, it checks if it's in the startup paths, and all this stuff, checks the extension, uh, it looks for the AES extension, and if all this stuff checks through, adds it to the queue. So, we have two threads running, we have one that's actively finding files to encrypt, and then we're going to have another one, which is going to be this encryptor that's going to actually encrypt the files and we'll see here it dequeues off of that uh, off that path queue and otherwise it just sits and locks it so let's see so we have text variable which is going to be the actual file path 
likely. So we're going to throw that into a asynchronous encryption function. And then we're going to log that we encrypt it. Um, I'm guessing this is like file name and then password. So yeah, we add that we encrypted this file name and then the first four characters of the password again, substring four of the password, so that you can verify that uh, in case it ran multiple times, which file got encrypted with which password. Uh, then it looks to see if there's a file name in the, or a ransom note in the current directory. If not, then it writes it. And if we take a look in here, let's see. Looks like they're actually going to log the IP and the ID. Okay, so here's the ransom note. And we'll see this is all Polish. And here's where the name comes from for this variant, Floterra ransomware in this weird UTF-16 character set. Um, other variants use like really fancy characters with circles and some of them said Vortex and that's where the original name of it came from. And we can already see they're, they're promising that's AES-256 but um, as I've learned from experience uh, never trust the ransom note. Um, spoilers in this case it is AES-256 but don't want to trust it. <laughs> So, all right, so we got the password here. Take a look at this function, encrypt. Now, uh, kind of an odd thing is that they actually make this a uh, extension. Um, what I mean by that is this, the, the, this um, moniker here. Um, you'll notice that we passed it only two, if you're not familiar with this in, in .NET, uh, we only passed it two arguments, even though it asked for three. But that's because it's an extension off of the string class. Um, so it's kind of a weird way of calling that. So we're going to follow this password is what I'm going to be most interested in seeing if they handle correctly. So we have this sharp AES crypt class. We're going to call an encrypt with that. It looks like we're going to use an extension of .aes. And they did pass true to the delete. They're going to delete afterward. Uh, error checking if they have an error put it in the error file all right so we're going to pass this to the encrypt uh, function and this is just going to open the file and then pass it to another function with the file streams all right so let's follow this password here so we take the password and this is just a static uh, function that then makes an instance of this class and this sharp AES crypt, actually, um, before I get too far, this is actually a standardized library that it looks like they included. And we'll see it's a C sharp implementation of the AES crypt file format. Um, so, blah, blah, blah. Here's how to install it. And we'll see actually, this is the exact, uh, the exact uh, code that we're seeing here. So, they mention it's an A. ES crypt file format. So that might be something interesting to look at once we uh, once we get some encrypted files. So we'll see it's a file encryption software. So first off it's a software you can just run to encrypt files but it's also a specific format that you can use a library. And this is how we would be able to read the file. We'll look at that probably later. So let's follow that password and since it's a like a standardized library, I'd expect it to not have any real flaws, but we'll just kind of analyze real quick what it's doing here. So we're going to take a look at the password. It's going to be uh, thrown into this here. And it looks like we just have some checking for nulls, making sure we got the right arguments. And this is actually a pretty explicit uh, format that has like, if we take a look back here, we have like a, a file marker and a versioning system. They have different versions of it. Um, they have like this extension section where you can add different metadata basically. So that's kind of interesting. And we see that right here, add an extension. And it looks like it uses the created by extension that uh, is actually mentioned right here. Ex examples of a standard extension is created by. So that's kind of cool. Um, actually, I lost my password variable. Keep that highlighted. Let's keep a look at that. So if flag six, if we're encrypting, so I'm assuming this is going to be encrypting first off, 
we're going to pass the password into a setup helper. And we're going to use that as our, probably as our crypto container. Let's pass this. So this right here gives us a lot of information. We're using Rigendale, which is AES. And we're using no padding, CBC mode. Now there's a hashing algorithm of SHA-256. Let's keep that in mind. There's a random gen number generator for some reason. And then an HMAC, uh, HMAC SHA-256. So... That's interesting to see that there's going to be some verification here. So let's just follow our password here. So they first off pass it to encode password, which takes it down here. We have an encoding of UTF-16. Uh, and then basically the gist of this entire function is it just checks for Indianness. Um, it's actually, the, uh, if you look in the original source code, it tells you that with the comments. Um, it's basically just going to turn the password into bytes and then check the Indianness of it. Uh, since it's UTF-16, I believe it actually turns it into wide characters, so there's zeros in between each. Um, so it checks the Indianness, and this block right here just flips the Indianness, so it's standard, I guess. So we've encoded our password, and we're going to generate an AES key 1. So this is interesting. So we take the password, and we're going to throw it through our hashing function. If we remember, that's SHA-256. And we're going to hash it 8,000 times. <laughs> okay. Um, so then we do that. And that's going to generate, uh, SHA-256 is going to generate a 32-byte key. So that means it is AES-256. Um, or, yes. So... Um, already we can tell what the encryption is going to be. Looks like they generate some random IVs um, based on the MAC address. That's kind of that's an interesting entropy to use. And then they do some hashing. So it doesn't really matter how they generate an IV because that's typically stored with the file, uh, which now we can kind of take a look back at the format here. We can see they're going to they're going to store an initialization ve vector, or the IV, uh, in the file. And then they actually have 48 octets, which is actually a byte. Um, they actually encrypt an IV and the AES key. Um, basically, the gist of this, if you actually read more into the, uh, the library itself and the, the help docs and stuff, each file with this library they generate a brand new password that's securely generated and then they encrypt that with the master password that you give it that's what it's talking about encrypted IV this is encrypted with like the password that the ransomware gave the library um, and then it's got an HMAC here and what that is is a way of verifying that this IV and a and AES key have not been tampered with because there are ways you can kind of tamper the bytes even without knowing what they are you can tamper it so that when it decrypts it becomes corrupted or something um, so that's a way to verify that hasn't been uh, messed with and then they have the encrypted message which is going to be encrypted with the AES key that's encrypted here and then we have a file size just for basically a check and then we have an HMAC of the encrypted message make sure that's not been tampered with as well so it's a pretty robust uh, container here um, so that's pretty interesting I don't see any way of really breaking this um, the actual encryption itself so let's go ahead and take a look back at that uh, that password generation because that might be our only chance at breaking this so skip back Jump back. Uh, I might jump too far. Let's find where they. Let's find where they generated that password. So we've got this current password. We'll see. This is a getter. Okay, they probably initialize it somewhere. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do Control Shift R, and we're going to analyze where this is set. Used by the get password function. Oh, okay, it was further up. Oops. So we have our current password here, current password, blah, blah, blah. So we're going to call this API get password. And this is the part that an older version of DNSpy will kind of choke on. 
Um, so we're going to see, oddly enough, they, they wipe the, uh, the shadow copies while you're getting the password. <laughs> Odd segmentation. But we're going to call a web client, and we're going to download a string from a URI. Uh, URI. There we go. And we'll see here. Here's the uh, quote-unquote server that they are pulling data from. And if I launch it in a browser, this is a uh, legit service. Um, we'll actually see each time I generate it, it's a completely new gigantic string. Now this is actually, uh, I believe, 120 characters. Yeah, it says right here. So it looks like there's actually kind of a format you can request different things with the alphanumeric and the length of 120. So if we like, there's actually different variants of this ransomware. Some of them use like 80 characters. Uh, there's one that's like 260 something. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, you kind of had to know which variant the victim was hit with. So at this point you would, uh, basically the, uh, the generation of the key is not uh, done in the ransomware. So we can't like see how it's generated. Uh, so at this point, I would uh, suspect I wouldn't have an idea on how to really break it, except for um, I actually uh, back in the day I looked up uh, you know the owner of this website and uh, communicated with him and he was actually very generous enough to uh, give me the source code or the, kind of the guts of how he generates random passwords with this tool. Um, obviously, security we did it in a very security conscious way. Um, he doesn't log any passwords, and I agree that it's good that he doesn't. But he did post on Git, uh, GitHub a uh, version of his ran random generator, basically. So if we take a look here, um, you know, he's got some different settings that you can actually select on his site for, uh, you know, which character set to use and the length, which is basically what we saw in the URL here. So he's just got a REST API that basically calls this function. And we'll see here, it actually uses the uh, mtrand command. So if we go to, or function, if we go to mtrand for PHP, the uh, mt actually stands for Mersenne Twister. Now, Mersenne Twister is a pseudo random number generator. It's not cryptographically safe. We'll see function does not generate cryptographic secure values. And blah, 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 blah. There's actually some details about where they changed the algorithm because they fixed it in a couple versions and then they had to fix it again. So if we go ahead and take his code here, let's just find an online sandbox for PHP. And let's kind of let's kind of play with this. Let's see how these passwords are generated. Let's paste that in here and generate random string. Just use the default. Well, let's go ahead and call it with 120 characters, I guess. So I'll execute that. And we get this uh, nice little garbage here. And each, each time we run it, we're going to get a completely different uh, different password. However, since this is a uh, pseudo RNG, basically, and it uses a Mersenne Twister, there's actually some known way, some other ways we could uh, break a Mersenne Twister, but in this case, we don't need to. We can actually um, we can actually brute force it. So, secret with this is it uh, it's only using a 32-bit seed, uh, specifically because PHP by default runs 32-bit. And I actually did confirm a couple variables with, with the developer um, of, of the website to see kind of how this is running. And we can actually set the uh, we can actually set the seed. So if we do mtsrand, let's just set a seed of zero, run that. No matter how many times I run this, we're gonna get the same password. So we can basically iterate through and generate, you know, some uh, 32 or two to the power of uh, 32. That's not how you actually do it, but that's how many possible passwords there are. 
So if we do like a seed of 100, we're going to get the same password. So a couple ways we could uh, we could just generate all these possible passwords and attack the file format and try each key with the file. However, we have a little bit of a uh, anti brute force that's built into this AES library. Um, if we take a look, uh, where was it? If we take a look into here, it's in the let's go to the encrypt function, go to here, follow the password, we go down to setup helper, follow the password, go to generate. When we go to generate this AES key, we're doing a SHA-256 8192 times. So this is like really, really slow. So each time we guess a password, we got to hash it over 8,000 times and then test it. Um, we can kind of optimize and tell whether, since there's no padding, we can't use padding to verify that our decryption worked. Because remember, this first key is actually encrypting the key for the file. So we can't like, ver we'd have to decrypt that key and then try that key on the file. And we, we've got like a lot of steps. So we could optimize this by uh, checking it against the HMAC, seeing if that matches. Um, but there's actually kind of a critical flaw that uh, let me kind of bypass that, so to say. So if we actually go back um, this also turns into kind of a story of how I broke this ransomware over a year, two years ago, whenever it was. Um, if we go back to where they are calling this, uh, let me jump back to when they, where they use this. We're logging the first four characters. So... What I was able to do is uh, we can actually use these these to optimize, generate all two to the thirty second power passwords, and narrow that down to only the ones that um, that start with these four characters. So that drastically limits our search space. Now the problem with this that I ran into is um, the website that generates these keys is actually running off of a CMS and this code was running as a plugin. So what I mean by that is he had basically other functions um, in the CMS that calls MT Rand for its own functions internally. So there's an indeterminate number and I wasn't going to ask him for the whole source code of his entire site. Um, that's just not very uh, very secure. Um, you know, he's got some other function that's calling S or MT Rand randomly. And we'll see that completely changes our that completely changes our outcome. If we call it again, then that completely changes our outcome. So this actually means I had to do a little bit more work. <laughs> so I had to um, actually if we if we take a look here. Let's remove these. Let's take a look at, we have this FL dollar sign L. If we remove one of these MT RANs, we'll notice it chopped off the first letter. We still have the rest of the string is actually the, the correct string. It's just because the first MT RAN call takes that first slot basically, and then we trimmed it off. So we kind of offset. So we've created a, an unknown offset so kind of what I did was um, I took to, for efficiency because PHP is a little slow when you're doing this, you know, 2 to the 32 power times. Um, I took this, the source code of PHP, which is written in C, and compiled that down and generated all the possible seeds and with an offset. So I generated, say, you know, this, uh, this ransomware took... Uh, Two hundred or one hundred and twenty characters. I generate like a thousand characters, and then search that whole string for those four characters that we know in the in the the password file. So, like, let's just say it was you know uh, these four characters. So, I'd I'd use this as a possible result, 
with that offset and then generate 120 characters from here and then try that password so it was a bit of work but it still narrowed down from 2 to the 32 power down to like 10,000 possible passwords and that was a little more reasonable to try even with the the extreme hashing and such um so we can uh we can kind of already tell how this is breakable but uh, let's go ahead and run it real quick so we can kind of see it in action now of course you would want to be kind of careful about uh, proxying your virtual machine before calling off to a c2 but um, I, I trust this developers website it's it's kind of a just a, a website that's for generating passwords it's not the malware authors server um, however there is another call in here if we go to send api here's the actual c2 of uh, the command ser server for the malware author we'll see here they uh, they post the ip the id and then the password uh, i'm not sure what, okay that's the date of encryption um let's go ahead and this will also kind of show another thing you can do in um in this program let's go ahead and uh, let's comment that out so let's go let me make sure okay return to string and download the string what's it returning is it just returning empty okay so if we right click on here and go to edit method we can actually edit the code <laughs> So let's just return empty. Compile. And we don't have to worry about uh, leaking my IP. <laughs> so let's go ahead and let's go ahead and start this. Let's break at the entry point. Don't have a valid extension, don't care. And wait for it to break. All right, there we go. So we actually, because of all the initializers and all that stuff in .NET, let's put a breakpoint here. Continue. There we go. Now we're going to generate our log file. There's the log file. Let's go ahead and check it out. Program data, keyboard. Nothing written yet, but the folder's been made. Okay, now we wrote to it. And there's timestamp start. All right, cool. Let's go ahead and let's find another place to break point. Uh, oops, that's a Boolean. Let's go to the click handler, which is our encryption. Go to start. Let's go into the worker. Let's go. Uh, yeah, let's let's break here. Let's go ahead and continue. Let it uh, start its thing. Running. And actually, I probably should have broke at the getting the password. Oop. All right, now we're broke. So let's see. We can see the current password. So here's the password it generated from our API. And right now it's on, it looks like it prioritized going after my pictures folder. How rude. <laughs> uh, let's go ahead and jump into that function. Maybe. Hmm. Didn't let me go into it. It's because it's called asynchronously or something? Okay. Looks like we're gonna jump over the uh, the chrysanthemum. Let's uh, let's go after dessert or desert. <laughs> so once again, here's our password, and we're gonna jump into here. We're gonna encrypt. Oops, that's a string concat. All right, jump into here. Blah blah. blah. Open up file streams, and we could jump more into here. So here's where we could actually watch the encryption happening, uh, if we so choose. But we already know it's AES, and it's got a really explicit file format. Uh, here goes the the file marker version and all that stuff. 
So since it already encrypted a file and dropped a ransom note, let's go ahead and take a look at this in a hex editor. And here we can see that format. So we have the AES file marker. Uh, let's go ahead and this Windows 7, let me do that. Yep. Okay. Let's side by side the uh, file format. So we have AES. Okay. Then we have three bytes that are that's or one byte that's the uh, version number we have a reserve zero and then we have all this stuff for the uh, for the extension block so that extension was created date and actually if you read in here the first uh, the first two bytes here is the length of this extension uh, it looks like with this resolution it's not gonna show both very well but we have this is the length and actually if we look here 23 bytes uh, matches up with our uh, created by sharp AES crypt and this is actually the library number uh, 1.0.0.2222 and then there's like an IV and the encrypted key which is uh, 30 yeah 30 hex and then then we got an HMAC and then the actual encrypted file starts somewhere somewhere in here and then like at the end of the file we have an HMAC, which would be probably that big. Then I think this is a this is a modulus, like a modulus size flag, that file size, um, and the actual encrypted message above it. So that's all fine and dandy. But let's um, let's go ahead and see if we can just decrypt that file ourselves. So I've already got since I'm cheating and I have the password here. Let's go ahead and grab that password we're encrypting with. And let's grab, yeah, no windows. Let's grab our encrypted file. Uh, let's tell it it's sharp AES crypt. So I actually embedded that library in my tool here and decrypt and yep, this is a JPEG stream. So we can go ahead and save that. Back to my pictures. I would like my chrysanthemum back, please. That JPEG. And we have rescued our precious flower picture. How fitting. Floterra. <laughs> so that's been an, an, an analysis of a ransomware that uh, does some interesting things, uses a kind of proprietary format that's actually open sourced so we can analyze its format without having to like mess with the ransomware too much. Um, and that generates a key using a public service uh, that we were able, that I was able to exploit back in the day. Um, the good news is uh, I believe the criminals behind this ransomware were caught. So happy ending. And the keys from the server um, after they, they did fix the flaw that I was exploiting after a while, but those keys were actually uh, seized by the cert um, team and released and the victims were able to use my decryptor anyway so if you have any questions or comments uh, feel free to put them in the comments um, but that'll be all for now tune in next time for some other ransomware shenanigans thanks <laughs>